is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 179, covering the week of July 22nd through July 26, 2019. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you don't want to find all those social media accounts, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all of our social media buttons. While you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. And you'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. You can support the Abbeville Institute by going to abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a button that says support. Click on that. It'll give you a drop-down menu. Under that, you'll have a donor options. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time donation. And anything you do is tax-deductible to the full extent of the law. We do appreciate any contributions that you do give because it helps keep everything that we do going. The podcast, the website, the conferences, all the material we have. So please consider a tax-deductible donation. It does help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. While you're also there in that support section, if you click on the little uh, button that says shop, you go out to that and it'll take you out to our uh, e-store where you can buy your Abbeville Institute embroidered apparel. You've got uh, t-shirts, golf shirts, hats, all kinds of great stuff. So you can also support the Institute that way and of course show off your Institute apparel, which is great advertising. So anything you can do there is, uh, is great. Also, uh, like our material on social media, share it around, um, so share around this podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and rate the podcast. That way more people will see it. Go on YouTube and uh, rate our material there. Anything you can do to spread the word, you are helping us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, and anything you can do, again, is greatly appreciated. Okay, so we had a great week at the Institute. Um, a lot of interesting material, I think, and it all goes down to one theme, and even the piece that seems to be out of place, which was the Wednesday piece on um, uh, Ode to the Confederate Dead, actually works with the other four pieces. And that is, I think the most important thing is denial. There is a certain segment of the mainstream academy that is interested in denial, or at least the suppression of a particular part of Southern history. This is, and I think that some people go overboard in promoting this particular side of Southern history. They emphasize it too much, but then there's the other side which seeks to deny. And that particular denial is, uh, I think, key if we're talking about uh, issues of uh, racial strife in the South and uh, some of the things that became very violent after the war was over, without question. And that is the complex relationship between white and black Southerners in the South, and the, in the antebellum South, I should say. There is, and even in the postbellum South, and we, we've published pieces on this before. Um, one of my favorites is actually, we're, we're going to be putting out a book in short order, a collection of some of the essays. Um, and uh, one of the one of my favorites is the Tom Daniel piece, You Was Kind, You Was Smart, You Was Important. And it's about his relationship with his uh, black nanny growing up. And um, I think that when we lose sight of these very complex relationships, it creates a climate of hostility. And by denying black Southerners a part of their history, you are creating, by default a climate of hostility. Because you see, by suppressing or denying the fact that many black Southerners, um, either directly or indirectly, supported secession in the war, that many black Southerners were slaveholders, that race relations were fairly complex, even in the Old South, you're essentially creating a situation where you have victims and oppressors. And... Um, Certainly, this is not to defend the institution of slavery in any way. It's not to say that uh, slaves were not uh, victims in that they were, in, they were slaves, right? So, I mean, that, that's a given. But there is a more complex relationship there than what uh, watching Roots 
or 12 Years a Slave, or this forthcoming film, Harriet Tubman, or Harriet, whatever it's going to be called, are going to show you. And I, this is not in, in, uh, in this particular week's material, but um, I'm going to probably do something with this in the future. I haven't decided how yet, but there's a, a book entitled Origins of a Southern Mosaic. It's actually a, a series of lectures by Clarence Verst, uh, Verstig. Uh, it was delivered in the 1970s, 1975. And this particular book is interesting. It's a series of lectures um, at uh, Mercer University. And it was pub published by University of Georgia Press, again in 1975. And it's probably not uh, a book that many people know about. But he actually brings up in this particular book um, that Slaves in the South, and he, he says, look, I make no judgment on why this happened or how it happened or what race relations were or racial attitudes were. But he points out in the 17th century in South Carolina, into the 18th century in South Carolina, slaves were armed. And this was part of the colonial charters uh, in the Carolinas. If you go back and you look at the, the proprietors and the charter for the Carolinas. It says that anyone who is able, essentially, should be armed in defense of the Carolinas. And that included slaves. In fact, there were hundreds of armed slaves in South in the Carolinas, which is South and North Carolina at that point. Hadn't split yet. Hundreds of armed slaves. And uh, the fact that these slaves also had wives uh, because there was a point when slaves were actually required in defense of the Carolinas against foreign powers and against Indian tribes. And um, these slaves, they needed more. So the Carolinas actually appealed to Virginia to send slaves into the Carolinas. Virginia said, fine, we'll do it, but you got to send us up women for one woman, one slave woman for every one slave man we send down there. And the, the, uh, the governors of, of the Carolinas refused. Because they said that's going to uh, that's going to break apart marriages. So we're always told, we're always told that slaves were never armed, that slaves were never allowed to marry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're told these things over and over again, whether it's in popular media or your uh, professor in college. But we know that there's more complexity to that. Now, of course, that that when, when after you had the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina, and some things changed. And after you had, of course, the Nat Turner Rebellion in Virginia, uh, the Nat Turner homicides, essentially, in Virginia, some things also changed. The slave codes more rigidly enforced, but we know that this differed from place to place and time to time. The institution was complex. And so by creating a situation where you have simple hostility from one side to the other, again, you create... Uh, a, a pattern which will result in uh, suppression of a part of Southern history that's an interesting part of Southern history, and uh, it's, it's valuable in its worth of what it is. Um, history should not be used as a weapon either way. Uh, but I think by saying, look, the South was complex and you had these things going on, and what I found with students when you tell them these things, so the South is complex, um, yeah, you had these bad things going on, absolutely. There's, it's not to deny those bad things did not happen. But to deny that the other part of it was there, and this is, I think, what Eugene Genovese has done very well in Roll, Jordan, Roll, what he did very well in The Mind of the Master Class, um, what Fogel and Engerman did very well in Time on the Cross, uh, what I think Mark Smith has done very well in a very little book entitled Debating Slavery. What they have done is, is show, and Mark Smith, of course, still teaches at University of South Carolina, what they've done is show that there is a little more to this. There's more complexity here. It's not to say the bad wasn't there, but it's also to show that we can't just uh, you look at this institution in pure, uh, for lack of a better description, black and white. There's gray areas in all of this. And so I think that's where we lose sight. And when I say we deny a part of Southern history, it's, it's, it's destructive. Because if you create this narrative that is just black and white, then you create, again, victims with a capital V, and you create tremendous animosity, and that does damage to two groups of people who have a hundreds of years relationship with each other, and that's white Southerners and black Southerners. 
And so I think the pieces this week did a nice job of showing some of this complexity. I mean, look, the first piece of the week, um, which is by uh, 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 Shane Anderson, Black Southern Support for Secession and War. Now, what he does not do in this piece is say that there are tens of thousands of black Southern soldiers running around defending the Confederacy. He does not do that. What he does do is pull direct quotations from newspapers in the South talking about black support for secession and, conf- and the Confederacy. And um, he says he's only scratching the surface with it. And this is true. I mean, there's a lot of material out there on this. Um, he says this, Perhaps most importantly, when discussing what the newspaper said about black support for Southern secession and war, it is important to remember that the reader is nearly always an outsider looking in. We are given an account of what black men are doing, but rarely are are we given his stated reasons why he is doing it. We are left to make whatever inferences and deductions that we can, if indeed we can judge motives at all. I think that we can, in fact, make some observations based on the press coverage. So this is true. I mean, this is the problem, and I've on my own uh, show, the uh, the Brian McClanahan show, I pointed out there's a, a new book coming out by uh, Kevin Levin, and um, this is on the myth of black Confederates. University of North Carolina Press is putting this out. And I, my critique, uh, I have, of course, the book is not out yet, but he wrote an article for the Smithsonian about this. And one of my critiques is that he draws conclusions without any evidence. And, of course, he's using language. I, the, the point was not to criticize his position, though, um, and, and I reserve that until the book comes out. But it's to, he, he draws conclusions and uses language based, his language is, is politically motivated. Uh, and that's problematic. It's politically motivated. It will be no different than when people complain about the language used in early 20th century histories of the South, you know, the Dunning School and others which they say is extremely racist. It's extremely racist language, so those books are not even good sources any longer. Uh, Now we've gone the exact 180 degrees the other way, right? So now it's, we're using language that's politically motivated the other way. Well, that doesn't do anybody any good either. And that's what I like about Anderson's piece. He doesn't get in in any of that. He says, look, here's what we have. We have these newspaper accounts just from 1861 of black support for the war or secession. He doesn't even get in any combat thing, nothing like that. It's just these are what newspapers in the South were saying about black support for the war. Now, were they lying or were they just simply pointing out some things that were being, that, some observations that were being made? And as he says, we don't know motivation. Very few Sources exist for motivation. Now, somebody posted in our on our social media side. Yeah, I mean, you can find some some people talking about this in the slave narratives. Um, you can go back and pull some evidence on why people did this. And there was one where it said uh, that one of the slaves who was interviewed said, "Yeah, there were a lot of black uh, people, a lot of slaves that supported the Confederacy, but they were the ones that were ignorant. The smart ones didn't do it." Now, this is one man's opinion. They were the ones that were not uneducated, didn't know any better. They were supporting the Confederacy. But he points out that they did. Now, uh, is his observation 100% accurate in knowing why people did it? Or were these people not uneducated? I mean, did they have an educated reason for doing it? Nobody knows. We simply know it happened. Uh, and we know that some people that supported it didn't really support the cause. We know, for example, Horace King in Columbus, Georgia was essentially forced into supporting the Confederacy. He was a, he was a free, a free uh, black uh, man in Columbus. In fact, considered to be one of the best engineers in the state of Georgia and Alabama. And uh, he built bridges. He actually built the staircase for the Capitol building at, in Montgomery for, um, uh, in, uh, for the Alabama State Capitol building. And he was pressed into service, essentially, providing lumber for the Confederacy. He provided the lumber for the, for the construction of the CSS Jackson um, and he effectively sued the state of Alabama after the war was over for back payment on some money that he didn't get uh, for for contracts. We know that he said himself he didn't he didn't support the Confederacy. He was a union man, but there were a lot of union people that were forced into providing services or labor or supplies for the Confederacy. This is a war effort, and of course the state was going to use everything at its 
means that it's disposable to, to win the war. So again, we have some people that said, well, I didn't really support it or I did support it. We also had some other uh, 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 black Southerners who said they did support it for because they supported the cause, right? So, I mean, this is, we know the complexity is there. We know it's there. But yet this part of Southern history is denied. Again, I think for political purposes. It's just as bad to say, and, and, I, and I'll say this, just as bad to say that uh, there were, you know, divisions of black Confederates and uh, that uh, black Confederates were all over the place. We, we don't know, uh, again, how much of that support was there, but we know it was there. And it's just as bad to say that all this, I mean, that the war was some kind of, of uh, biracial uh, utopia in the South. I mean, we know that there that, that wasn't the case either. I mean, there was a, uh, a certain, a racial stratification in the South. We know that was the case too. So um, it's, it's not, when you get engaged in both sides, you create problems, right? But, but by denying the history of this part of it, you're creating a, a very hostile climate in the 21st century. So uh, Anderson goes out and says, you know, we learned that 150 able-bodied, free-colored men of Charleston yesterday offered their services gratu- uh, graciously to the governor to hasten toward the important work of throwing up redoubts wherever needed along our coast. That's from the Charleston Mercury. A number of free enslaved Negroes are engaged on the redoubts of the coast. This is from the Wheeling, Virginia Daily Intelligencer. Even the free Negroes are coming forward in large bodies and tendering their services to the governor to work without pay on the fortifications being thrown up at Charleston. This is from the Nashville Union American. Uh, I mean, so this is, these are from newspapers, right? Uh, we learned from Mayor Lane that 15 or 20 or more free Negroes came forward yesterday morning and volunteered their services to go to the fort and work or assist in the defense of the fort. If required, labor is enough. Having gone to the fort, they were not sent down, but requested by Mayor Lane to hold themselves in readiness. Um, so he's, Anderson says, some men simply offer to do whatever is required of them. There are, these are the catch-all articles, which list various actions taken by the black population in response to the crisis. And he cites uh, New Orleans newspapers, Richmond, uh, um, North Carolina. I mean, there's, there's, he just lists uh, citation after citation of people talking about black participation either in the secession or for in favor of secession or helping uh, the war effort in one way or another. Um, he, he continues, he, say, um, he says, look, an important piece of evidence when considering the broader picture of this press coverage is that stories like these largely ended after 1861. We know that there was an initial rush of enthusiasm and patriotism for the war in 1861. And it seems clear that in some cases, the black population was affected just as much as the white population was. These men got caught up in the spirit of the times. And again, there are newspaper stories that indicate that. Quote, secession flags dot the country along route from Wilmington. And even the Negroes waved the Confederate banner at the cars as they passed. This is from April 24, 1861, the Central Georgian. He does say... It would be a mistake to take these few small samples and try to use them to make the case that there was a massive black support for the Confederate war effort. And it's important to remember that the free black population was a tiny minority in the South compared to the slaves. So many of these stories concern a minority population within a minority. In the aftermath of the John Brown raid a few years earlier, black freedom was often precarious. While researching the topic, I've run across many articles where someone in the state legislature wanted to pass a law to expel expel the free black population from the state or sell individuals into slavery. Sometimes the fact that they had earlier volunteered for the war effort was recalled and then the effort shut down. Punishments for minor crimes could be harsh. Freedom for the black man did not offer social equality with his white neighbor. Nevertheless, we must not deny these men their agency and free will by attributing their every action to the fear of the white population around them. The social environment they lived in was a factor in whatever decisions they made, but that does not mean that they were not capable of patriotism, love of home and state, and a desire to defend their own possessions, property, and family just like the white population. In several cases, they said as much, and those words should not be dismissed. Um, so, I mean, I think that at, at that paragraph says it all. You're, you can't you can't draw major conclusions either way, and to uh, to not if you if you don't have evidence for a particular position, then don't say it. To draw conclusions based on no evidence is just mere speculation. But this is what a lot of historians do. Well, I mean, these free blacks supported, but why were they afraid of people? Were they? I mean, we don't know. 
we don't really know, but yet I'm going to make these conclusions based on the fact that I don't really know. You can't do that. That's not historically accurate. Uh, and then the piece on Tuesday, the book review by uh, Vito Musamelli, The Barber of Natchez. It's a book that was published in 1954 and then republished in 1973. Um, it's a book about um, a man named William T. Johnson who was in uh, Natchez um, and then spent some time down in Louisiana near New Orleans, and he was a barber. Um, and, uh, he was a free black slave owner and this, he was actually murdered by another, by another, uh, black man. And this particular story is interesting because again, it shows the complexity of Southern society and in the antebellum South. And I think that stories like this serve well to show that, you know what, you can't just say the South was this or this. And I, I remember years ago, I was in my office and I had uh, Koger's book on my shelf and it's big title, Black Slave Owners. And I had a colleague of mine walk in and he's not a historian. He was just somebody who was, he worked in another part of the, of, of the college. And he said, he looked at the book, he said, wow, there were black slave owners? And I said, yeah, I mean, they were there. This was a, a, about black slave owners in South Carolina. Certainly they were there. Uh, you had black slave a lot of them in uh, in and around New Orleans and um, in Louisiana. Of course, they existed. They existed all over the South. In fact, uh, in the 1830 census, there are large numbers, thousands of of uh, slaves that are owned by uh, African Americans in the South. So um, this is a part of Southern history. Again, the complexity of Southern history that's often left out. And to make an agenda, to do something, to have a, a SJW, social justice warrior agenda, you've got to have victims and oppressors. And uh, you need to, when you remove the complexity and you simply draw a conclusion, well, these people were just supporting because they were scared. Uh, or where uh, Levin says these people uh, were only fighting because or only doing these things because if they didn't, they ran away, they would be, uh, their family would be abused. There's no evidence of that. There's no evidence whatsoever. But yet he's drawing conclusions based on nothing. He's drawing conclusions based on having watched Roots too many times, or uh, you know, Twelve Years a Slave, or Django Unchained, whatever it is. Um, and so that's that's where we we run into problems with this. Um, and I think that when you look at, for example, the piece on Thursday, which is a Boyd Cathy piece on Song of the South, and one of the things that Song of the South does, and it shows. An unequal situation. There's no doubt about it, and, and it's a uh, you know the Disney piece, and um, but it also shows the complexity of Southern society, and that you have it's just like the Uncle Remus stories. You have people that were certainly unequal, but they were respected uh, in, in families, and I think that that actually goes a long way to helping improve race relations. I mean, look, yeah, you you can recognize, yeah, I know these these relationships are unequal. That's not good. To have a situation where we have uh, people that are not considered uh, uh, on the same citizen status or even citizens at all, uh, but there was a familiar relationship that produced uh, all kinds of uh, human intimacy feelings. Uh, there's, there's so much evidence of this uh, that uh, around the Old South and the post-bellum South and uh, and, and particularly, as I said, that, that Tom Daniel piece, you as kind, you as smart, you as important. We minimize the impact of these human relationships that developed. And I think uh, Tom said in that piece, individually, um, this is where people were, were just confused about these things. Because when you look at groups, yeah, there, there, was, there was a situation developing where there was a lot of group conflict. But individually, you didn't have any of that still. Um, and so he's very, he's, it's a very interesting piece to get into that. Um, and I think that's where, uh, when, when you look at some of the agitation that's taken place, you lose all that familiar, familiar relationship, the complexity, all of those things. And, um, it's, it's, uh, it's Hollywood. I mean, you have to create an image and then that image, you have to create victims and oppressors again. So, um, that's why I think this week is important in looking at these relationships uh, and, and why the Song of the South, which um, is a di film that Disney will not allow to be, to be re 
uh, to, to uh, come out under the Disney label. Again, they've said as much. Um, this is why that film is so important. I mean, people, generations grew up saying, yeah, you know, there was a, there was a, you know, in some cases, very good relationships between white and black Southerners. This is true. Um, there, I, 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 uh, I wrote a piece years ago, about two, three years ago, on the website. Um, There's nothing like them old time ways, and it was a, it was a piece about an Ohio woman who wrote dialect stories, and it's poetry. And one of the, one of the, uh, poems in that particular piece, one of the stories, and she collected all these from the former slaves. I mean, she's writing this in the late nineteenth century. She's going around to the South and collecting these stories, and it was one about an, old, an elderly uh, black man, and he complained about the young individuals. They picked on him all the time because he still had reverence and still had, uh, he still, he loved where he was from and he loved the, he loved the formality of things. And these, he said these younger people just, they were disrespectful. They didn't have any, they, they didn't care about themselves. And he said, there's, there's something wrong with that. What's happened here is we've created a, a much different situation in the South, and that's not good. This is, this is the voice of an African-American in the, in the South saying these things. And, of course, you can say, well, that guy's duped. He's, just, uh, he's duped by the situation. He's, he's been turned into uh, you know, the Stockholm Syndrome. Um, but maybe there was something to this. Maybe there was the complexity there and the relationships that were there were different than what most people, again, what you're going to get through Hollywood or through your popular press. I mean, when we lose that, when we deny parts of history, we create a difficult and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, as I said, hostile situation. Now, this is where the piece on Wednesday, uh, and then the piece on Friday, it talks about you know, Confederate monuments and racism. Uh, it's Phil Lee. He always does a very good job with this. Um, and he talks about, um, the, <laughs> the fact that race relations were pretty bad in the North. Uh, and he uses the Jack Johnson fight, which I also illustrate in my classes too. The Jack Johnson fight is as part of this, where Jack Johnson, who was a heavyweight boxer, uh, was, um, defeated several white fighters and, uh, the most, uh, famous being Jim Jeffries and, um, it was 1910, and, and Jack Johnson beats him thoroughly. And I'll, if you go out and you um, and you read the accounts of this, Jack London, who the progressive Jack London was there actually reporting on the bout. And this took place in the Southwest, and the chance went up after Jack Johnson lost to kill this man, to kill Jack Johnson. The white crowd was demanding here, and not not in the Deep South, but demanding that Jack Johnson be killed. Um, the New York Times remarked, quote, if the black man wins thousands and thousands of his, of his ignorant brothers will misinterpret his victory as justifying claims to much more than mere physical equality with their white neighbors. That's in the New York Times. After Johnson won the fight, race riots erupted in 50 cities within 25 states. New York, Washington, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Omaha, Wilmington, Columbus, St. Louis, and Pueblo, Colorado as well as the southern towns of New Orleans, Little Rock, Atlanta, and Houston. But there were race riots everywhere. <laughs> um, he, he says it took boxing promoters another five years to find a six-foot-seven-inch white fighter, Jess Willard, to beat the aging Johnson in 1915. After winning the Havana bout, Willard temporarily became the most celebrated American. When his victory was displayed on a bulletin board in New York's financial district, the war from the streets would have done credit to a presidential victory, according to the New York Tribune. For a moment, the air was filled with hats and newspapers. Respectable businessmen pounded their unknown neighbors on the back and acted like lethal children. At a time when the average American earner earned $600 a year, a New York lecture hall offered Willard $5,000 for a single week's engagement. Um, so he talks about the race riots in the North and, um, and then he concludes since racism permeated the entire country from 1900 to 1920, it's a stretch requiring a bungee cord to conclude that racism was a significant reason to erect Confederate memorials. The obvious explanation is that the old soldiers were fading away and the impoverished South had finally accumulated enough money to memorialize them some 50 years after the war ended. I mean, yeah, uh, go figure. But um, people say this is all about Jim Crow. We're just putting these things up to show why. So what about all the Union monuments at the same time that were going up? I mean, it just these these arguments are so stupid. 
They shouldn't even be validated. But this piece shows that, yeah, the United States in the early 20th century was racist. I mean, North and South. Everyone knows that. <laughs> Everyone knows that. But again, you deny some things by, by engaging in, in a in an us in, in a in a righteous cause myth and that's where we get into what happens now the piece on wednesday does not seem to fit with this because it's a piece about tate's ode to the confederate dead but it does because the point of this piece is to discuss what the living and the dead is is history still living and if it is if history is still living then when you deny a part of that history you deny the living you deny a living a part of their patrimony of their past, and you should not do that. Um, and it's actually immoral to do that. Uh, it's evil. And this is some things I've said on this podcast before. It's evil to deny Southerners part of their history. Why didn't black Southerners to have pride in their history? And in any way, it's evil to do that. This is not to say that, again, to minimize the downside of and, and the horrible side of the institution of slavery at times. It's not to say that. But what it is to say is that, look, there's complexity here. If we want to contextualize everything, and this is what the left, we want to contextualize that statue. Well, let's contextualize the entire of Southern history and show, okay, contextualize it. But show that there were black Southerners that supported the war for whatever reason. We don't know why, but they did. Uh, contextualize that. Uh, if you're going to put up a, a thing denying, you know, talking about slave owners, say that there were black slave owners as well. I mean, sh shouldn't we do that? If we're going to contextualize everything. But see, that takes the sting out of it all. So you don't do that. But this is where uh, the left has done a very good job, and the progressives and the establishment have done a very good job in creating this victim mentality and why it's good to publish these pieces because it shows the complexity in the South. And I think that's something important for the future of uh, Southern history and the Southern tradition. Yes, every tradition has its thorns. We know that. We know the South had thorns. Every rose has its thorns, right? So we know that. But was there complexity in everything? And can we look at that and, and try to, to gain something from that as well, from that story as well? And I think that's the value of history. It's the value of the Southern tradition. There is complexity in it. So, hope you enjoyed uh, this week in review at the Abbeville Institute. Until next time, good day. Good day.